Uh, so uh, thank you, Tom, for the invitation to come speak at the seminar here today. Uh, it's a pleasure. And, uh, I guess with that, let me get started. Um, so today I'd like to discuss a regularity result on the singular portion of the free boundary in a lower dimensional obstacle problem. OK, so there's a lot there, so let me unpack that a bit. So what is a lower dimensional obstacle problem? Well, it's a minimization problem, a variational problem, where the set of functions over which you minimize is constrained to lie above a given fixed function that's defined on a lower dimensional submanifold of the ambient space. Okay, and so this—that's the thin part. That's the thin part, exactly. Right, as opposed to a sort of the classical obstacle problem, wherein this constraining function is defined on the entire ambient space. Okay, so for simplicity, since I want to understand sort of a model case. Um, we're going to take our lower dimensional submanifold as Rn living inside Rn plus 1. Okay? Uh, and so for us, the problem is going to be something, well, maybe we've seen before with a minor modification, is uh, we're going to look to minimize a weighted Dirichlet energy okay, in uh, the ball of radius 1 in Rn plus 1, okay, with this parameter uh, A, or this weight A, sitting between minus 1 and 1, okay, where here I have a set A, which is defined the set of functions W that are even in Y, okay, uh, take some particular prescribed boundary data. And sort of most importantly, when I look at the lower dimensional subset, Rn, my function w has to sit above some given function phi. Okay? And this guy here is called the obstacle. Okay? Um, now, maybe a little bit of notation. So for us, uh, let's see. So a big point x is equal to xy, which is in Rn cross R. Okay. Um, and yes. Okay. So any questions so far? So you got boundary, you got a boundary condition. So I've got a boundary condition on the entire ball. Okay. So G lives here. So this is my lower dimensional set. OK, phi is a function lives, on there. lives here. So phi equals phi of x. OK, maybe it looks something like this. And my boundary data lives here. OK, my solution is somehow going to, well, maybe touch the obstacle at some portion and then separate. And I don't know, maybe it attaches in some funny way. Pardon? So this is the gradient in x and y, right? So it's the full gradient of my function, because I want to emphasize that I'm working in sort of Rn plus 1. But this weight, this integral weight, y to the a, only is concentrated in some sense right, on the set where x equals 0. Okay. So if I were to draw a picture of the weight, maybe this will help. right? So say this is, uh, let me do it this way. Exactly. Bn is a ball in Rn plus 1. And I guess if I look at y, right, y to the a when a is negative looks something like this. And when it's positive, it looks something like this. Okay? So what it's doing is it's either emphasizing or de-emphasizing where the obstacle lives. Okay? OK, and you might say, well, why do I have this weight? Right? If I took A equals 0, I get the standard Dirichlet energy, and I'm in the world of harmonic functions. Right? And the point is that this weight is related to well, a lower, uh, an obstacle problem in one lower dimension, which is the obstacle problem for the fractional Laplacian. Okay? And so essentially what this problem is, at least with this particular weight, is a local formulation in one higher dimension of this non-local problem. Okay, and the sort of big deal about this is that it allows us to take into account sort of local PDE techniques to help solve and resolve issues in a non-local problem. Okay. So this reduces to a to a fractional. 
Yes, so basically what happens is uh, if I have my solution, so let u be my solution, OK? And if I consider this limit, y goes to 0 of y to the a dy u x y, OK? So this will actually be the fractional Laplacian s of u at x, right? OK? So when I take this, this weighted normal derivative as y goes to 0 for each point x on the thin space, right? this operator will correspond to taking the fractional Laplacian of my function u when I just restrict it to y equals 0. OK, so I maybe the better way to write this is with a 0 here. OK. Um, and again, this guy is an operator on just n variables. And this c is sort of one more variable. OK, and what is u? u is my solution to this problem. OK, so u be the solution. OK, and I'm just saying that there's this relationship to the, the obstacle problem for the fractional Laplacian. And I don't want to spend too much time on it. I'm just trying to give you a motivation for why this weight exists and why we'd want to study it. OK, any other questions? So yeah, I realize there's a lot of setup and things are pretty complicated. So I want to make sure everything's clear before we proceed. Are we OK? Great. OK, so maybe let's simplify things a little bit. OK. Um, and let me tell you about the focus of the problem and uh, a sort of simplifying assumption. OK. So obstacle problems in general are all free boundary problems, right? And what this means is sort of the, the primary focus is going to be a set which we call gamma of u, okay? where again, u is my solution, which you can get from the direct methods of calculus of variations. Right? And this is going to be defined oh, sorry, as the topological, topological boundary in Rn of the contact set between u and my obstacle. Okay? So again, it's delivering in this lower dimensional space. Okay? And this set here is often denoted by gamma of u and is the contact set. OK? Uh, and again, u is my unique solution. right? And this set here is called the free boundary. OK, and why is it free? Because it's an a priori unknown of the problem. right? My solution exists, but I don't know how or it's related necessarily to the obstacle phi. And this is an important thing I want to study. Okay, and the sort of regularity of my, my function and the regularity of this free boundary are intimately related. Okay, so uh, as I said, I want to make a sort of simplifying assumption that'll help us understand the model behavior of solutions. And so that assumption is going to be that my obstacle phi is analytic. Okay? Which then I can actually make a reduction to say that from the point of view of the, the regularity of this problem, for phi is identically 0. Okay? So I'm not going to say much about that, but the point is really we're going to be looking at the case when phi equals 0. Okay? So it's sort of the simplest thing I can look at. And what this means is essentially I'm looking at the topological boundary of a well zero level set of my function. Okay? And now my function on this thin space is constrained to be non negative. Pretty simple. OK, so now that we've got the setup out of the way. Uh, that's only interesting if your g has some. Exactly. So g, g has to have some compatibility condition with the obstacle for the problem to even have a, a contact set. right? And in this case, g is always going to be prescribed to live above the obstacle on the boundary of where they might actually have any meaning. But, but otherwise, it has, to, it has to have to be negative somewhere. Otherwise, you've got a trivial. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, great. Any other questions? Wonderful. Okay, so now that we've got this sort of setup uh, out of the way and some motivation for why I have this this weight um, and maybe some pictures to go along, let me tell you a little bit about the history of the res uh, on this problem and sort of what's known, um, because that'll inform well the result that I'd like to discuss in the end. And so, kind of without the history, we can't get to the result. Uh, let's do this. Okay. 
so the, I guess the first major breakthrough in this problem was made by Athanasopoulos, Caffaroli, and Salsa in the case when a equals 0, so the harmonic case. And then soon thereafter by Caffarelli, Salsa, and Silvestre in the general case. And I think the key observation they made here was that, well, if I look at Almagren's frequency function, <coughs> OK. Uh, Are they looking at the thin set or the general? Pardon? Are they looking at the thin, the thin case or not? The, I'm looking at the thin case, yeah. right? So for this particular problem, yeah. right? And I'll, I'll define what I mean by Almagren's frequency function in this setting, right? For some point x not in my free boundary, okay, is the, the map r goes to n r u x not, okay, which is defined to be this integral, the integral over b r centered at my point x not on the free boundary of again this L2 norm of the gradient weighted, okay, divided by the average on the boundary, the L2 average. Okay. So this quantity, right, is monotone, I'll say increasing, okay, uh, as a function of R. Okay. Um, and in particular, something else that they showed is that my solution U is say kappa homogeneous with respect to x naught if and only if okay this guy here is identically equal to kappa okay so some intuition about this frequency function is maybe well if i consider just a generic harmonic function and i forget about these weights or take a equal to 0 Right? And I say my harmonic function equals 0 at 0, and I take x not equal to 0. What this guy is going to give me is the value of the sort of first non trivial homogeneous piece of my harmonic function at that point, or at 0. Right? So it's giving me infinitesimal behavior understanding of my solution or my harmonic function right? at that point. OK. So you might say, well, why is this a big deal? Um, well, why? Because this gives us some notion of compactness, right? And what it allows us to do is rescale and blow up, and we can zoom in. We get an understanding of infinitesimal behavior from my solution, right? Which in the end will be related to, well, how my function separates from zero at the free boundary. Okay. So in particular, if I look at the set of functions u x not r for r going to zero, where this is defined to be, well, what you might expect. I translate over, okay, and I divide by r to the minus n plus a integral dbr x naught u squared y to the a to the one half. Okay, this guy here is weakly precompact in w one two log of Rn plus 1 with the weight, OK? So what I can do is I can take, well, understand what limit points are, right? Um, and so in particular, something else they did, oh, this was sort of bad boy. Well, I can put it here, uh, is the next thing they observed, right, is that if I define lambda x naught to be the value of the frequency at 0, frequency function at 0, right? Uh, this guy is going to be greater than or equal to 1 plus s with s equal 1 minus a over 2. And this s is precisely related to this value here, OK, which comes from the order of the fractional power I'm taking on the thin space, OK? Um, and they noticed that limit points of this set are lambda x naught homogeneous solutions. 
okay, with respect to their own boundary data. Okay. Okay, so what this is in fact doing is it's saying, right? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by uh, homogeneous solutions. So, okay, so in this problem, right, if I just say I want a solution that's homogeneous with respect to some value, right, I can try to find a solution to that. Right? Oh, I'm pretending that G doesn't exist, right? I'm just oh, saying, let me look for a global homogeneous solution. G, G, does, not G does not exist. <laughs> so that's why I said subject to its own boundary conditions, right? Um, but yes, exactly. In this case, you can think I'm working on all of Rn plus 1. G doesn't exist. And I just look for a homogeneous solution, OK? Um, and so that's what you get here. And notice that this value here right, is independent of the blow up sequence I take. Right? So this is a, a property that's inherent to that point rather than the procedure I find this value, through which I find this value. Doesn't matter how you take your r's? That... Exactly, right? So whatever R K R sequence rk I get, right? I have a sequence rk going to 0 by this pre-compactness up to a subsequence. I get a weak limit, right? And well, that weak limit will be a lambda homogeneous solution right? with this particular homogeneity. OK? Yeah. It's with respect to x, yeah, exactly. So w y no longer shows up here because I'm sort of throwing away y by looking at this limit as y goes to 0. OK? This was sort of just really a side note. We can discuss it later if you really want to understand what's going on here. I was just trying to give some motivation to the problem. Um, is that OK? How about we just discuss it later? All right. Is that OK? Thanks. OK, uh, so, so this was sort of an important observation, right? I define this lambda x naught as this value here, right? The limit as r goes to 0 of this, this function here, which I know is increasing. So I know the limit exists, and it's positive. OK, and I'm saying that because this is monotone, if I look at these set of rescalings, I have some back compactness. And when I look in the limit, right, any limit point of this particular set, right, as r goes to 0, will be a lambda x naught homogeneous solution to the problem, to the global problem. OK, so if you're coming from the world of minimal surfaces, you can think of this as like a tangent cone. Mm -hmm. So th I'm just saying that this value has a lower bound. And what is that? S is exactly this number, 1 minus a over 2. OK, and the point is that. I mean, just connecting back to this, this fractional Laplacian problem, right? this value s corresponds to exactly the value s of the fractional operator that you end up seeing in the lower dimensional space. So when a is equal to 0, I mean, this is, these are everything, these are harmonic functions, and this will be, well, 1 half, right? So I'm saying that maybe it's a plus. Yeah. Uh, it's, and then it's a plus, right? Uh, yes. No. Yes. Plus. Did I define a? No, that's right. Ah, uh, yes. Three halves. One plus s. Exactly. But this is the, the first term that you say. This is at the limit you get the mm -hmm. vanishness. For harmonic functions, you have, you get the for the solution. Yeah. And this is, and of course, you have this at least two halves. Exactly. That's all I'm saying at the moment. At each at each point on the free boundary. Yeah, right. So I've, I've restricted my attention to the free boundary. I guess maybe this was unclear up here, right? So I'm, I mean, I've forgotten about the problem outside of the free boundary. Right? <laughs> my goal is to understand the regularity of, of this particular set, which is gamma view. I'm so sorry if that wasn't unclear, was, was that unclear. So everything from now on is going to be about the free boundary, OK, or its relation to maybe the context set. Your goal is to get good regularity. Exactly. My goal is to understand, well, what, what this set looks like, right? I mean, I've called it a, a free boundary, but at the moment, I don't even know that it has the right dimension to be called a, a boundary in Rn, right? I mean, you should think of it as n minus 1 dimensional for it to really make sense, but I mean, we don't know that's true. Um, at the moment, I'm just saying, okay, well, what historically have we learned about the sort of this problem and, and how was that studied? So, yeah, I see. Right? And you know, my point is essentially that right, there's this frequency function that exists that's modeled or coming from the theory of minimal surfaces that happens to apply here, 
right? And it's sort of giving us some, some way to potentially attack understanding what happens on the free boundary. Okay? And I'm just trying to outline that for you. So this is, this is exactly the topological boundary of where I'm touching the obstacle, right? So I am touching the obstacle, but it's really this point here where I say, OK, so this is my obstacle. I separate here, right? And then, OK, basically, this is, say, phi equals 0, and this is my solution but you u. Exactly, right? Because in the end, I'm, I'm interested in the regularity of those levels set, right? And so I want to understand the behavior of the function. So what I'm really end up doing is I'm, I'm trying to produce a, a Taylor expansion of my solution right? at points on the free boundary, Okay, if you want to be slightly reductive. Any more questions? Great question. A lot of questions. Well, I don't mind. Um, OK, so, so we've got this, this notion of sort of tangent cone right, to the problem here at points on the free boundary. OK, and what this also does is it allows us to get uh, sort of an optimal regularity result for my solution. So I know that u is going to be, say, c1s uh, in b1 half plus or minus, which means on either side of the thin space, but up to the thin space, not necessarily across. OK, and if I want to look at behavior across, I know I'm only Lipschitz across. OK, and this is optimal. And these are all, these are the classical results of the These are classical results of, of these two, this paper, or these two papers, I should say. Right? So it's first studied in the case of A equals 0, which corresponds to harmonic guys. And then later on, Caffarelli, Salsa, and Silvestre studied this problem more generally. Okay. So we've got some optimal regularity of the solution. We've got an understanding of, well, some understanding of, of the infinitesimal behavior, or at least sort of a minimal infinitesimal behavior of solutions at the free boundary points. Okay, and I guess sort of the, the big result here, and to sort of accumulate all the knowledge they gained in this paper, is that if I look at, let's see, the set of points on my free boundary, okay, where the frequency, right, is precisely equal to 1 plus s, which is the lowest frequency, okay, this guy is an. Uh, well, I should say C1 alpha uh, n minus 1 dimensional submanifold of the thin space of Rn. Okay? So, in particular, this set is relatively open with respect to the free boundary, whatever that means at the moment, right? And it actually can be written as a C1 alpha graph that's n minus 1 dimension. OK? So I'm saying this, this piece here, if I restrict my attention to all the free boundary points, yeah. where the value is precisely this lowest value, 1 plus s, mm -hmm. OK? Then I collect all those points together, right? This, these points together form a C1 alpha submanifold that's n minus 1 dimensional. So in particular, this portion has the right dimensionality, has some basic regularity. So okay? if I draw a picture of this, and, I mean, I have some, some kind of. I'm, in, I'm looking at r n minus 1 here, right? Mm -hmm. are, are you, yeah. So this is in n minus 1, right? So this is r n, right? So here's maybe my contact set, yeah. right? OK, and, and basically this is kind of the picture here, is that my, in, in my portion, right? So this is u equals 0 here. And then this here is my gamma of u, at least restricted to this regular portion. <laughs> Okay, so in particular, right, this is a subset of the positive density, in particular half density points, because as a nice example, right, you can, it's actually part of the result is to show that limit points of this set, right, when I look at, in particular, have this value, right, if I look at ux not 0, uh, this basically looks, when I restrict to the set y equals 0, looks like some constant times some direction, OK, dot x, the positive part to the 1 plus s. OK, so this is all in the thin space. So the picture would be, right, I have something like this. Well, here's my contact set. And then I go up 
by, and this is D, this is D, 1 plus S. Oh, that's a terrible picture. OK. So this is the blow up in the thin space okay, at these lowest frequency points. Okay, and in the sort of larger space, it looks something like this. This is a terrible picture, but we'll try it anyway. Um, uh, okay. So here's where I'm identically zero. In this case, the free boundary is just a point, and then I start increasing, right, like distance to the power one plus s from the origin. Okay. Great. Okay, so, so this is sort of a major breakthrough, and I guess the first major breakthrough in understanding, well, what does this set look like? I mean, I don't have any full understanding, but I know that, right, well, when I look at this particular portion, right, I have a very strong understanding of what's going on. And in particular, following that, there are higher regularity results that say in particular, right, that the regularity of this particular set, this regular set, as it's called in the literature, right, is limited by the regularity of the obstacle. So in particular, in this case, when phi is identically zero, this set here is an analytic submanifold instead of just a C1 alpha submanifold. Okay? And there's some finer results. Uh, and for instance, Robin and I proved something that gives you an understanding of the exact loss of derivatives with respect to the regularity of the obstacle. Okay? Great. All right. Let's move here. So what happened next was people said, well, that's great. We've got some understanding of what's going on. And I have an example of when this particular behavior actually exists. right? But what about, well, other potential values of this, of this frequency function? right? I mean, I've just said it's bounded below by 1 plus s. And when it's exactly 1 plus s, I have some understanding of what's going on. right? Um, and if I sort of look at the picture, I realize that these points are a subset of the points of positive density. Right? And so you might say, well, what about the points of zero density? Okay? And this was studied by first Gorofalo and Petrosian for the case A equals zero, and then subsequently by Gorofalo and Rosaton in general, right? And they said, well, if I look at the set of zero density points, the points on my free boundary, such that the limit as r goes down to zero of hn of contact set intersect br of x naught uh, over r to the n. OK, this is supposed to equal zero. Right? It's zero density points. Well, what this is, is this set equals the set of points on my free boundary where the frequency is precisely an even integer. OK? So now I've, I've said, OK, well, I knew I had a lower bound of 1 plus s. And it turns out that all of the zero density points, these sort of lower dimensional portions of the free boundary, right? have very specific frequencies. Is that, is it, why is that intuitively clear? Or? It's a very good question, and I, I don't think I have a, an answer for that. Um, I mean, I can sort of give you an example, or like a, an answer through like a silly example, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Never mind. But yeah. Um, it, 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 it wasn't obvious to me. No, no, no. And I think this, I mean, it's a, it's a very beautiful paper in Vencionis, and so it wasn't obvious to anybody, I think. Um, uh, OK, so, so they said, OK, we can actually characterize these zero density points. Um, and along the way, what they're able to do, right, uh, and this is quite important, is they're able to consider a different set of rescalings at these particular points. So I say, let x not be a point where I have, say I have a, uh, Okay, let x naught be such that lambda x naught equals kappa, and this say is in 2n. Okay, what I can do is if I take these homogeneous rescalings, okay, for that particular value, 
this guy will converge locally uniformly to some function p, which I'll call p star x naught. Okay? And this guy here, as I know, is, is going to be kappa homogeneous. Right? But it's also a polynomial. And it's particularly aharmonic, or in the case when it equals zero harmonic. Okay? And in fact, it's non negative on the thin space. Right? Is there some monotonicity that allows you to do that, or what? So it's the monotonicity of Omega frequency function plus two others, which are a uh, vice type and a mono monotonicity formula, which I won't tell you about. But yeah, it's, it's a collection of monotonicity formula uh, results. OK? Here you're by R to the R to the kappa. So basically, what I've done is I've said, this guy here is going to somehow fix the L2 norm, okay. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not going to help me understand what the Taylor expansion of my solution is per se, because it's going to mess with the coefficient. It just gives me homogeneity. And when I look at this rescaling, right, this is the guy that's going to help me understand what's actually the Taylor coefficient for the, that part, I would think, right? Mm -hmm. For the kappa homogeneous piece. OK. And in particular, right, this shows that blow up or limit points are limits are unique, blow ups are unique. OK. And this is very important because, well, in particular, right, it's able to give us a rectifiability result for this portion of the free boundary. So if I define sigma m kappa of u to be the set of points in my free boundary with lambda x naught equal kappa, again, an even integer in this case, right? And now that I have this particular unique polynomial, right, I look at the spine of p star x naught. And this guy should have dimension <coughs> equal to m, right? What's the spine? So the spine is the number of translation invariant directions of my polynomial, right? So it depends on, in this case, in the thin space, n minus n, n minus m variables, OK? So when I restrict my attention to this particular subset, I collect all these points, right? This guy here is contained in an m-dimensional. C1 submanifold of the Rn. OK? So this is giving me a rectifiability result, and in fact, a pretty fine one of this, what we'll call, singular portion of the free boundary. All right? But I, I thought you were, uh, are we in Rn now? Or am I well, so I'm, I'm saying, right, what's happening here, right? This, this free boundary lives as a subset of Rn. Right, so I can pretend well, that, right? It, I mean, I'm, I'm throwing away that extra dimension because all of the behavior of my function is really there. Okay, so it doesn't extend outside. Right? Well, how bad can these things look? Uh, they can look pretty bad, I think. Um, that's a that's a good question and, a, and a, <laughs> I guess an open one, right? I mean, to some extent, what I'm giving you here is like a piecemeal understanding historically of what's happened. Right, and um, and I'll tell you, I guess, about like an open question or two, uh, and I guess one more or two more results that'll kind of fill in some more details. But still, I think the for for instance, right, the potential values of this lambda x naught are are unknown, uh, I guess, outside of a lower dimensional set, I should say, which is a recent result that I'll tell you about in a second. Um, so you say, OK, great, right? I've got this beautiful characterization, but is this, a, is this a, an empty paper, right? I mean, of course it's not, because otherwise, well, who cares, right? But uh, it's very, very easy to come up with examples that sort of sat satisfy this. I mean, take any homogeneous uh, polynomial that's positive in Rn, and take the harmonic extension to Rn plus 1, the upper half space, and then take an even reflection to the other half, right? So here I'll draw I'll draw a nice example that will actually help us understand a little bit of what's going on. All right. So example two. So let's work in the case when a equals zero. Okay, and let's say I look at x1 squared, x2 squared, and then I extend harmonically. 
<coughs> to R3. OK, even, evenly, right? OK, so this guy is a global solution that's four homogeneous. OK, and so in particular, I've exhibited something where cap equals four. And what does the free boundary look like? Well, so here, in this case, the free boundary is actually equal to the entire contact set. And the picture in R2 is like this. So I have x1 equals 0, union x2 equals 0. OK? And what happens here? OK, so I say at the origin, this guy here is a four frequency point. And every other point is a two frequency point. OK? So with this particular very simple example, I've exhibited that multiple frequencies can exist at the same time. right? And in particular, I can have a situation where I don't even see the slowest possible frequency. right? So everything is totally lower dimensional. right? Does this make sense? Um, now, this isn't to say that these behaviors are mutually exclusive. You can cook up examples where you have something like this, maybe. So this would be your contact set, right? And here's this regular portion, and here's a singular portion. Okay. Um, so this is a possibility, at least picture-wise, and, and examples. You can make examples. OK. So in the end, I want to discuss a, a generalization of what happens here, which is to say, well, we know that for this regular portion, right, there are these high irregularity results. So uh, a simple question might be, right, can I improve this containment to something better, right? C2, C10, C infinity, C something, depending on the regularity of the obstacle. OK, and sort of a preview of, of what I'll say is that, in fact, you can up to lower dimensional subsets, right? So in particular, I can make this C2 once I throw away something that's strictly lower dimensional. Is it possible for the dimension of the spine to be n minus 1? That's the top dimension. Okay, that's definitely possible, and in fact, that's the the setting in which we can say the most. Okay, so we'll see that in a second. But great question. Okay, so then you might say, all right, great, right? I have this lowest frequency. I have these sort of zero dimension or sort of these zero density points, right? Maybe this is it. Like, oh, wouldn't that be nice? But <laughs> it's pretty fast, and you say, well, it's it's actually not even close. By a very simple example. Say so example three, again, we'll say when a equals zero. If I just look at the real part of x plus i y to the power 2j minus 1 half with j any integer, okay, this guy is going to be a, a solution, right? And he's homogeneous, so it gives me a whole nother set of frequencies, right? And okay, there's a modification with respect to s or a. But that's less, less about the point, right? So you say, well, what happens here? So these guys actually have positive density, right? And other than that, it's sort of hard to under Well, we don't really know what else is happening besides these guys exist. So a big question, open question, as I said, was to understand, well, what are all the possible values for this lambda x naught? Right? right now, we have an infinite family. But is it, is it sort of uh, is it discrete? Is it some continuum, some portion of R? I mean, I don't know. Um, OK. Uh, and so you say, all right, well, this open question, right, is, is there some sort of partial answer? And there is a partial answer. And this was recently done by Fogardi and Spadaro. OK. And what they were able to show is actually that this gamma of u Right, actually has the sort of dimension that we want is uh, h n minus one rectifiable. Right, which means that it can be contained in the countable union of n minus one c n c n minus one c one manifolds up to a h n minus one measure zero set. Okay. So it's, it's slightly weaker in terms of rectifiability, or well, weaker in terms of rectifiability than, than this result here, which involves no measure zero subset. Right? 
But at least we've got a notion that well, it has the right dimension. Okay. And two is that we're able to say that lambda x naught is in fact a discrete family, 2j, 2j minus 1 plus s, or 2j plus 2s, OK, outside an n minus 2 dimensional subset. OK? So when I throw away a much lower dimensional set, I actually know that my frequencies live well, where I was kind of expecting based on the examples I have, or I know, and can write down. Cool. So again, this is a partial answer to the frequency question. OK. So I guess another natural question is you say, well, all right, so I've got like all these potential crazy frequencies. I have no idea what's going on. But is there some condition I can place on the obstacle that might simplify my problem in terms of frequency dramatically? Right? Might say, I can rule out all but I don't know, frequencies that I like, all right? Uh, and so this is true. There is a sufficient condition that allows one to do this. And this is in a paper by um, Barrios, Figali, and Rosotan. OK? And what they show is a non-degeneracy condition, OK? So let me explain what I mean. So if I take my boundary data, g, remember phi is identically 0, OK? And I extend it a harmonically, you think a equals 0 or just harmonically? Harmonically to be 1, just solve the Dirichlet problem with g as the boundary data, OK? Call that function g. So now it lives in all of b1, OK? And I look at the Laplacian, right, just in the thin space of G. Okay, and I restrict this to the thin space. Right? So everything here is living on the thin space. Okay, if this guy has a sign, okay, positive, then what do I get? I get that the frequencies are gonna be either one plus s. Or two. Okay. So what this is going to do is going to rule out this sort of crossing phenomena, and it'll give you a picture closer to this. Okay. And why I call this a non-degeneracy condition is, in particular, this condition allows them to show sort of a, a minimum quadratic growth of your function as you go away from the, the contact set. Okay, which translates to this frequency condition. And they can do this for any for any for any point on the free boundary. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, you can have the, your power. You can have the Any value of A. Not the case. No, it's not the harmonic case. Right? That's why I said A harmonically. OK. So, I mean, maybe I should tell you what A harmonically means. Right? So, I, def I look at the operator divergence in x and y of y to the A gradient xy of v equals 0. This guy here it means v is A harmonic. Yeah, yeah. OK? Which is the Laplacian when A equals 0. OK, so you say, all right, well, I've got some, some nice conditions, right? And, I, and I've got a, well, a pretty solid understanding of what's going on, but still I'm pretty far from a full understanding. OK, so now let me turn to the result I alluded to, which is the result I'd like to discuss in the, in the last 15 minutes. Maybe I'll put it here. So this theorem is joint work with uh, Xavi Fernandez Real, who's at ETH. This is one person, not three. Um, and it goes like this. OK, so one, if I restrict my attention to the non-degenerate setting, Okay. 
which means I have this sign condition. Okay. Uh, then what happens? Well, first, if I look at the set sigma m two u, right? Because all I care about, as I said, is generalization of the singular portion, right? Result, right? And I throw away some exceptional set, right? This guy here is locally contained, okay? In a single uh, m dimensional C2 manifold. Okay. Uh, and the dimension of E is at most, uh, it should be m minus 1. So I say I throw away a lower dimensional set, and I can improve the regularity of my containing manifold to C2. And under this non-degeneracy condition, I actually get something like I was hoping, which is this crossing phenomenon doesn't exist. Right? And so I have this containment of a single manifold, at least locally. Right? Cool. OK. Um, and I guess so for most of this talk, you could have forgotten about A. Right? But the curious thing is that when I look at this high regularity result, or high regularity, something curious and interesting happens is when I look at the case when A is negative, okay, I can say something nice, which is the top stratum, right, is locally contained. In a, a single again, okay. Uh, C1 alpha, uh, I guess I should say, sub-manifold. OK, and this guy is n minus 1 dimensional. And you don't have to take anything away. I don't have to take anything away. So this is curious, right? Um, and one curious thing I, I like about this is that sort of this is the first time, I think, in the literature when we look at this, this class of problems, which you say, well, OK, maybe they're just unifiably treatable. Right? You actually witness distinct behavior. Because with all of the other papers, right, there's a uniform approach to treating all values. And you get the same result with sort of a, a parameter that follows you around. Right? But no, no distinct behavior. Whereas here, we have distinct behavior. Right? So only when A is negative right, do I get this extra regularity generally right? in the top stratum, just the top stratum. Now, is there an intuitive reason for this? Why you know, I, I, OK, so in, in some sense, I'll say yes. Um, OK, so I don't know about intuitive, but I can give you sort of a technical reason, which maybe those who are coming from sort of measure, uh, minimal surfaces in geometric measure theory might, might be able to better, explica better explain, is that in this setting, right, the, the spine of this polynomial, this blow up, Right, which is n minus one dimensional, actually equals the nodal set of the polynomial, which is the set where, right, uh, it vanishes and its first derivative vanishes. Okay, whereas in general these two could be quite different in size. One's always contained in the other, right? But when I have this alignment, right, it gives me a way to introduce some or leverage the symmetries of the problem in a way that I couldn't before. Okay, and why does this happen? Okay, so a sort of another reason why this happens is because blowups at in this particular setting, when A is negative and I'm in the top dimension, right, actually end up, well, I should say second blow ups, sorry, actually had have a, a different behavior than sort of second blow ups in the, the lower dimensional case or when A is greater than or equal to zero. And I'll tell you about that in, in just a second. That was a lot, right? Um, but let me finish saying the result and then we can get to sort of what happens and why. Uh, okay, so I say great. So this is the non-degenerate setting. Um, uh, okay, and this says everything can be contained in a C2 manifold outside a lower dimensional set, and in the top stratum, I don't even have to throw away a lower dimensional set, and I still get some gain in regularity. Okay, when A has this value. Okay, 
Uh, and then you might say, well, what about the non-degenerate set, or sorry, the degenerate setting? Uh, I should say else. OK. Well, else, 1 and 2 hold. OK. With uh, after replacing. Uh, single with cannibal union. <coughs> okay. This is when I'm dealing with the two stratum. Uh, and generally, okay, if I understand or look to the top stratum for any value of kappa greater than or equal to four. I get to repeat what I have before. Okay. So I'll say 3. If I restrict my attention to the top stratum, sigma so n minus 1 kappa. Okay. And I throw away an exceptional set, uh, n minus 1. OK, this guy is contained in the countable union of C2 manifold. That are n minus 1 dimensional. OK, and the dimension of this exceptional set is less than or equal to n minus 2. So just, again, a generalization of what we saw in the case before, but just for the top stratum. Uh, and when a equals negative, or a is negative, okay, what do I get? Is I get that this top stratum is contained in the countable union of C1 alpha kappa n minus 1 dimensional submanifolds or manifolds, whatever. Okay. So sort of the gap in this in this result is understanding the higher frequency lower stratum points. Okay. Um, and that's just a subtlety that uh, we we don't really understand at all. Okay. So you might say, well, how do I go about proving this result? Right? In, in the last sort of seven minutes, let me, let me outline that and tell you about all of the things that I just said before. Yes? Um, so for this 2 minus 4, do you know that these statements don't hold for A? Because you can do it only once? No. We don't know that. Um, suspect, that? suspect they don't. Um, OK, and, and my expectation that they don't hold in particular will come from a, a result that's, that's similar, that predates ours, for the classical obstacle problem. OK, and I won't say too much about that, but if you want, we can chat about it later. Um, but I would say, I, in some sense, I would say these are kind of sharp. OK, that's a big statement, but and I, I don't really want to explain what I mean by that, but uh, yeah, I'll just say that. <laughs> If you'll allow that. Oh. You, you, you have a good understanding of when k is an even integer. Mm -hmm. Do you know 2j plus 2s points might exist? As blow ups? Uh, or do you expect, expect those to be very small sets? I mean, well, okay, so the 2j plus 2s we already know, right? exists outside. OK, you're saying, how large is that set? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'll just say but I don't they know. they do exist? Uh, uh, I believe they do exist. I'm not 100% sure. I don't think it's been proven that they actually arise as blow-ups. They possibly arise as blow-ups. But I don't think anybody's like found an example where this frequency like shows up concretely. Uh, but don't hold me to that statement, please. OK? All right. 
OK, so here we want to say, well, how do you, how do you get your hands on, on something like this, right? which is a pretty technical result. And it's just in its statement. It takes up, well, more than a half. Um, and you say, all right, well, ideally, well, I kind of want to just follow what these guys did. Right? I'd say, OK, somehow I'd like to subtract off this first order Taylor polynomial, well, this, this, this first Taylor polynomial, right? somehow blow up get like a higher order infinitesimal behavior understanding of my, of my solution, right? classify these blowups. If I can show that they have a jump in homogeneity, in fact, that they're kappa plus one degree <coughs> polynomials, right? then I can hope to apply some sort of Whitney extension theorem, inverse function theorem argument like these guys do, right? and get this result. Right? So if I can show that, well, I'll just, yeah, let me, let me let me write down what I mean exactly. OK. So let's just say outline of proof. OK. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, remember all we care about is a particular guy in one of these sub-singular strata. Right? So kappa is some even integer. M is some dimension, particular dimension of the spine. And if I look at Almagren's frequency function, OK, n r u x naught um, minus p star x naught, OK, uh, maybe I should say, uh, did I do this one? Uh, zero, OK. So I, I put the translation inside the function, right? <laughs> I can prove that this guy is greater than or equal to kappa. OK, and increasing in R. So again, I have a monotonicity formula, right? Or I have a monotonicity for Omegan's frequency function, even when I subtract off this first blow up at these singular points. OK? Pardon? I can prove it's strictly larger than kappa, right? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You said strictly larger. Uh, so no, I can't prove it's always strictly larger than kappa. Uh, and I'll say this, right? So these results about the C1 alpha kappa say that there's strict, like it's kappa plus alpha kappa, right? Is the lower bound for those particular points. So if I look at n minus 1 kappa, right, I can show that this is kappa plus alpha kappa. Right? And that gives me the C1 alpha kappa containment. OK, and if I can show that right, at the vast majority of these points are outside a lower dimensional set. This is kappa plus 1 or greater than kappa plus 1. I get C11. And then some continuity result about the second blow ups, which would be when I rescale these guys appropriately and I take limit points or take limits, right, would give me C2. OK, so that was a lot. Let me just sort of say a little bit more. OK, so maybe I'm totally out of time. Uh, so. Yes. Uh, great. OK. So this is true. I can look at sort of limit points of appropriate rescalings of this guy. So u x naught plus minus p star <coughs> x naught divided by, OK, the Almagren L2 rescaling, L2 on d b r. At x naught, uh, yeah. Well, so do we are. Okay. Uh, are again uh, homogeneous with value given by this at zero, sort of similar to what we saw before in the the Athanasopoulos Caffarelli salsa, Caffarelli salsa Silvestri problem. Okay, so I get limit points are homogeneous, and the the Interesting thing is that when a is greater than or equal than 0, I get uh, that these guys are homogeneous polynomials. Okay? And the case when n equals 1 and a is less than 0, I get that these guys are solutions to a co-dimension 2 obstacle problem. Okay? So we've been talking about a co-dimension 1 obstacle problem, right? where my obstacle lives in Rn, <coughs> and the whole problem is in Rn plus 1. So in fact, Blow ups at this sort of funny a minus a negative top stratum 
end up being solutions to a problem where the obstacle lives on an uh, n-1 dimensional set, right? And the whole problem sits in Rn plus 1. OK? Um, and then sort of to finish, you then say, OK, I'll just in words, right? Can I understand the, the set of points where this is precisely well, greater, where I jump by 1, kappa plus 1? And you can show that that's a subset, or that outside of a, a lower dimensional set, this happens. Okay, in the cases that we've outlined in the theorem. And this is through some Federer dimension reduction type argument. In fact, two different ones are needed. One for this sort of case when A is negative and I'm in a top stratum, and another more standard one in the other cases. Okay, and then it's uh, to sort of jump from C11 to C2. You have to show new uniqueness of blow ups and a continuity result for these sort of second blow ups, which would come as limit points of this set. Okay. And then again, it's just this federal, it's a federal dimension reduction style argument, which I won't say more about. OK. Uh, so I apologize for the sort of very fast bit at the end there. That's a lot to take in, I understand. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. But that's it. Thank you. <laughs>